Is it we like about the South? This is audience participation. You don't have to raise your hand, just shout something out. What is it we like about the South? Home. The food. The sense of place. The place, sense of place, home. It was right. It was right. Okay. The weather. The weather. Anything else? Friendship. Friendship. I'm sorry, what was it? Graciousness. Graciousness. Hospitality. Hospitality. Yes. The pace, it's slow, people, right. It's a, it's a, <laughs> if you're not in Atlanta, right. It's amazing that you say all these things because you know what, people have been saying these things about the South in popular music for over 100 years. So I'm gonna talk about that because all those things you just threw out there, Northerners and Southerners are saying those things about the South in popular music, as we're gonna see. And I also wanna talk about something that Alan said, um, and he was talking about gospel music, and it's about the land and being tied to that land. And um, you know, Hank Williams Jr. and I'm gonna I'm gonna have a slide on him. Um, but he said something that I think was he had a song. If heaven ain't a lot like Dixie, right? I don't want to go. If heaven ain't a lot like Dixie, I just as soon stay home. If they don't have a grand old opera like they do down in Tennessee, you can send me to hell or New York City. It'd be about the same to me, right? So. That's, that's important because it's that image. It's not that they're saying the South is a utopia. They're not saying that. But they've already got something that's just about as close as you can get here. It's, it's, it's real. It's tangible. It's something they can see and feel. And so that's what the South was. And it's interesting. You go back to the 1600s and you look at what Puritans said about New England. It was a place to be endured. They had to go there and they had to deal with the weather. And it was awful. Southerners, it was a wonderful place. There was all this wild... There was Food everywhere. You can come down here. You can have a plantation. It's great. And all they wanted to do was recreate what they already had in England. Just bring it over here. So it's a different view of life. Outside, it's the secular view, not just religion, but it's secular. So we're going we're to talk about that. And of course, the title of this presentation, Sing Me Back Home, is, comes from the, the Southern diaspora. You know, you got Merle Haggard. I'm going to mention Merle Haggard. And um, we've had a, a couple of lectures on that already in Pat's Abbeville conferences. So this is why Clyde insisted we had these last two songs. I'm going to re reference you to your song book, right? So we're going to get out our hymnal a few times, and we're going we're gonna re <laughs> to read some of the lyrics as I get there. So make sure you have that handy. But um, this uh, Detroit City, which actually um, had it, some people titled it I Want to Go Home. I mean, that was, that's what they called it, but it's Detroit City. And then I Sang Dixie by Dwight Yoakam. Those are both from that Southern diaspora. So but we're going to talk about that <clears throat> in different ways. So let's get started. Now, <clears throat> it's often, we, we talked about Northern music, Southern music. And when you look at Southern music, one of the things that people often key in on and they focus on is that it seems like Southerners have a lot of songs about states. We've got Sweet Home Alabama, We've got Carolina, we've got Tennessee, we've got all these, we've got Texas, Louisiana, we've got all these places. And it doesn't seem like there's anything coming out of that for, I mean, there's no Sweet Home Massachusetts, right? Nobody sings that. I'm going to go to Sweet Home Massachusetts. Uh, we do have songs about New York, which, but New York is unique. New York was kind of like, remember, New York wanted to secede. <laughs> New York City wanted to go, so New York has always been a different animal in and of itself. So that creates a unique attachment, which is similar to the South. But Southern music is provincial. It's a reflection of the culture, as, as Dr. Daniel pointed out yesterday, that produced it. And every Southern state has a song dedicated to it in popular culture. And so the lyrical content of this post-bellum Southern music, regardless of form, style, or genre, can be divided, I think, into two categories. One is in affirmation, and one is in defiance. Not defiance of the South, but a defense of people, place, and family against outside forces. This is why, at one point, you have that, the people embrace that outlaw image, the acceptance of the term rebel, 
That was a badge of honor. You were a rebel. Nobody, I mean, nobody wanted to be anything but in the South. It was great. And then you have affirmation, a love and respect for people. They work together, right? Because you love your people, you're going to defend those people against somebody saying that you're backwards or you're a hillbilly or you're whatever. You, you, don't, you don't want to have people say negative things about you. So these two things certainly work together, and if you look at postbellum Southern music, it all fits in that. Part of the process of reconciliation in that late 19th century is going to factor into music. So reconciliation moved forward in the 1890s with the election of William McKinley. Now, McKinley's a Republican, and I just, for those of you that the podcast, I was very critical of Republicans, and rightfully so. But McKinley actually was the first president to have a Southern strategy. He actually toured the South during the 1896 presidential campaign, came down to the South, and he met with Southerners, and they were willing to put aside their differences and vote for him because, or at least some Southerners were, because at least he was listening to them again. There was this idea that people needed to listen to the South, and so that was very prominent in the late 19th century into the early 20th century. And keep that in mind because Northerners are going to be very respectful of the South in the early 20th century. They loved it. Just as much as Southerners did, they loved it. And of course, this is also buttressed by the Spanish-American War. Southerners signed up in large numbers to go fight the Spanish. This was coming back in the Union. We're back together again. We're going to go fight the Spanish. We're going to avenge the Maine. Remember the Maine. And the, the interesting thing, of course, where I live, right across the river from Columbus, Georgia, James Harrison Wilson, who burned the city in 1865, came back in 1898 and was mustering people in there in Columbus, Georgia, to go fight in the Spanish-American War. So in one, in one instance, he's burning it down. The other, the other, 30 years later, he's trying to get people to go fight with him to go fight a common enemy, the Spanish. And that was, you know, crossing the chasm. Of course, by the time you got to World War I, you saw a lot of the same thing. And then in 1905, President Teddy Roosevelt ordered that a stash of battle flags found in the basement of the War Department be returned to the South. Now, Cleveland had tried to do this. But uh, there was a lot of backlash to it. So, ta But R Roosevelt was able to do it. Remember, Roosevelt's mother is a Southerner, an unreconstructed Southerner. She loved the South. And so Roosevelt, for all his, I mean, he's, he's, in, he's in my nine presidents who screwed up America. But uh, as a president, he's terrible. But in this case, this is a pretty good thing. And Presidents Taft, Wilson, Harding, and Coolidge all spoke to Confederate veteran groups. All of them. And all but Taft were photographed at Confederate memorial events or with Confederate flags. All of them. It wasn't seen as a bad thing. You, you were proud to be in front of that flag. This was, again, healing. It's reconciliation. This is something that the left doesn't even want to, to acknowledge. Or if they do, they want to sweep it under. They want to get rid of it. This is a bad time in American history. Nobody should have reconciled with the South. All these people were bad for doing this. But in the 19-teens, when all these Confederate monuments are being built, 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, 19-teens, this was across the United States. So for people that charge, you know, uh, that these things were built for racism, I mean, it's just, it's stupid. There's no other way to describe it. It's stupid. Now, Southerners exerted a great deal of influence in the United States government during the Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt administrations. Absolutely. Americans recognized the South as an integral part of the American society and its culture as distinctive. And the music that we're going to talk about reflected this trend. One of the people, this is just an example, Irvin S. Cobb of Kentucky was the highest paid newspaper columnist in the 1910s, 19-teens. And the South, in the South, Reconstruction and the War were prominent in American society. Remember, Birth of a Nation uh, was the most popular film in the 19-teens. And uh, commemorative events and monuments, North and South, all reflected this. People were thinking about the war. It's 50 years on. And so they're, 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 they're conceptualizing, they're, they're looking back, you still have veterans alive, and they're, they're, I mean, if anybody should have been mad at the South, it was the guys that were being shot at by Southerners. Yet they were willing to say, hey, you're a soldier, I'm a soldier, let's bury the hatchet, we're all Americans now, you, your side was fighting for what it believed was right, we were fighting for what we believed was right, and we're back together. Is that not what we really want? I mean, this is what so Southerners wanted, not Northerners. So World War I imagery utilized a crossing of the chasm, as I said, with Northerners and Southerners shaking hands to fight a common foe on the Hun. Northerners loved to sing popular songs about the South. As we're going to see, they were an affirmation of people in place, a reintegration and celebration of the South into the Union. 
This is great. We love to be in Dixie. Dixie's one of us. And while they might be quaint or a caricature of the region, they nevertheless help create a very positive image of Southern life. All the stuff you said, these songs say too. We're going to see it. Southerners often talked about going home, going back to a place they just, that just seemed better than anywhere else. It had better food, no doubt. I mean, nobody talks about northern food. So, does anybody ever say, you know, I can't wait to go to Boston and eat? I mean, I guess if you wanted some lobster or something. But, you know, you, nobody ever says, gosh, I just want to go up there and eat their food. Nobody says that. <laughs> uh, but people want to come down to the south. and I mean, look at all the famous chefs. The, the Paula Dean, of course, who's now persona non grata. But Paula Dean, and, and you had uh, the Cajun chef. There was no, there was no Boston chef on TV. <laughs> uh, you know, even, even the pioneer woman is from Oklahoma. She's very, it's very southern cooking that she does. So, uh, the, the, no, southern food. People, peop I mean, the, the warm hospitality, that about the south. Southern bells and southern gentlemen. This is something that people recognize. There is just a difference in southern people. Nobody wants to retire to Massachusetts. Amen. Bob Dowd retired to South Carolina. <laughs> he escaped. <laughs> nobody wants to retire to Massachusetts or New York. Nobody does that. Why? Because nobody wants to be shoveling snow when you're 75 years old, right? So uh, you want to come down here because, look, just drive through. Seabrook Island, look at all the houses. I guarantee you a lot of them are northerners living in those houses. Uh, the music, as we're talking about, and of course, family. In fact, one of the albums I'm going to discuss is, is titled Southern Family, and it's, it's a song I think is really good in it. Uh, Southern history was also recognized and celebrated as American history, particularly in the, uh, in the 1950s through uh, popular culture and mass media, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. So this spirit of reconciliation lasted through World War II and lingered into the 1960s, but then we know a lot of things changed. So actually, I'm going to start with some early Southern recordings. That's a picture of Polk Miller. Polk Miller was from Virginia. He had a group of singers called the Old South Quartet, and they toured from 1900 to 1912. And he formed this quartet, again, about 1900. He learned to play the banjo in 1892. He's not, he's not very good. Uh, I mean, he's, he's not Allen, right? He, he's, not, he's not that good. Uh, and, but he, he wanted to, uh, and the songs they sang really were, were part of Southern culture. They, they, and, and they started recording these things in the 19-teens. And I'm going to play you one of these early recordings. It's entitled Watermelon Party. Who wouldn't go to a watermelon party? The thing is, these other four singers were all African Americans. So it was Polk Miller and four African Americans. And they uh, were in New York City. In fact, uh, it's rumored that um, Mark Twain introduced them at the old Madison Square Garden. Uh, Joel Chandler Harris enjoyed the show. And this was kind of like a minstrel show, but it was widely popular. And the only reason they disbanded the, the group uh, is because they, his, his four black singers, and there were several different groups over time, were receiving uh, death threats in the North when they would go into these other areas to, to tour. So um, this is why he got rid of, of the Old South Quartet. But I'm going to play this Watermelon Party. This is essentially an old uh, black folk song that they recorded. Now, you have to understand, in the 19-teens, to record music, what you had is you didn't have electric microphones. You had a horn, and you had to sing very loud to try to get it into that horn, and they'd record it on, they'd, they'd put it on the cylinder, and so uh, a lot of these 19, this is why they sound so teeny. There's, it's because there's no amplification whatsoever. So. And a watermelon party quiet be given here tonight. Oh, you're talking to us, you're coming along with me. Get on, on your good behavior now, and don't you ride no bike. Oh, you're talking to us, you're coming along with me. Nice rolls, possum down, sandwiches and ham, some ice cream apples and some huckabee jam, sweet caters and persimmons and some California grapes, all the twist them niggas appetite and most we know the change. Everybody is born in the night. All they're singing about is the food. Born in the I mean, that's great. And we're going to hear... Um, we're going to hear some more, uh, some more of that tomorrow. They actually had a recording of the Bonnie Blue. Same group, 
Okay, but they're singing the Bonnie Blue. Now, uh, I guess that all these uh, African Americans hated that song, but uh, here you had four singing the Bonnie Blue. Now, Billy Murray. Billy Murray was the most popular singer in America in the 19-teens. The mo I mean, it would be like having, he was like Adele, you know, or uh, Chris Stapleton of, of the 19-teens. This guy was everywhere, and if you had recorded music, you had Billy Murray songs. He's originally from Pennsylvania, but then settled in Colorado. Okay. Over there, if, in World War I, over there was the patriotic song written by the Committee of Public Information, essentially to go and fight the, go fight the Hun, go over there and you know, uh, tell, uh, don't, don't have your sweetheart pine because you know your boy's in line, that kind of thing. So you go over there and you go, be, be, go fight for the empire. He also sang, you know, Tessie, you are the only, 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 uh, which uh, in, uh, in the uh, first World Series, they changed the, the lyrics of the song to reflect the fact that uh, Pittsburgh lost. Uh, they, they changed to Hon Honus Wagner, that he was uh, this terrible player. So this guy was very popular. And he actually had a group called the American Quartet. And they, I put two songs up here. Uh, are you from Dixie? Because I'm from Dixie, too. Now, I actually put the lyrics in here for you. Are you from Dixie? Because I'm di from Dixie, too. It was written in 1915 by uh, Jack Yellen, who was a Polish Jew who wrote FDR's 1932 theme song, Happy Days Are Here Again. Uh, so he's, he's from the North. Uh, George Cobb, a New Yorker, wrote the song. So you had New Yorkers, Northerners, writing, Are you from Dixie? Because I'm from Dixie, too. Hilarious when you think about it. And this thing was widely popular. Everybody loved this song. Or anything is nice if it comes from Dixieland. I don't have, I don't have that in here, but uh, I, I believe uh, Cobb was also one of the authors of that song, too. Now, common themes, I'm going to play these, a little clip of them. Common themes, warm people in place, great food and music, southern bells. I mean, they all wanted to go date southern women, all these northerners. Go down, date southern women. I guess the women in the north just weren't worth it. Uh, uh, and the dates, of course, correspond with, uh, with World War I. Um, and, of course, Jerry Reed covered uh, this Are You From Dixie? Because I'm from, from Dixie, too, in 1969. It's one of his biggest hits. Uh, so let's hear the uh, Are You From Dixie? Every winter you will notice that the birdies in the sky Oh, I'm sorry. This is anything of nice as it comes from Dixieland. I got them reversed. if it comes from Dixie land. It stopped. All right, so let's play Are You From Dixie? Because I'm from Dixie too. And of course, it has Dixie in it, right? Hello there, stranger. How do you do? Pardon me, but I don't know you. Don't be surprised, you'll recognize. You're no detective, no, I just surmise. What? You're from the place where I long to be. Your smiling face says the same to me. You're from my own land, that sunny homeland. Tell me, can it be? Are you from Dixie? Yes, I'm from Dixie. Where the fields of cotton beckon to me, I'm glad to see you. Tell me how be you. Then you move forward into the 1920s, and you've got New York's The Happiness Boys, Billy Jones and Ernest Hare. This was a very popular radio program from 1921 to 1939. In fact, they were the highest paid uh, act on the radio in 1928. And they have a great song. 
I'd rather be alone in the South, right? I'd rather be alone in the South. So again, sunny people, warm weather, Southern bells. It's better to be in the climate there than around the horrible people of New York. It's wonderful. So here we go. We'll alone in the South. Mm -hmm. Very good idea. I'm going to tell you about it now, Bill. Speak, brother. I'm Dixie Bound. Yes, sir. When payday comes around. That's right. Don't try to stop me now. No, sir. Straight as a dog. Mm -hmm. Into Dixie's heart. You're right. You can't be satisfied no. anywhere else somehow. You said it. I would rather, very much rather, be alone in the south uh -huh. than blue and down in the mound. Where the crowds and lights are all the sights to see and you would sooner be a communer with the birds and the bees. You're speaking, that's why I say I can hardly wait for the choo choo train. <laughs> I got a mammy there, a sweetie there, a little Ford runabout. But if I had no one beneath the southern sun, you would still stand up and shout. That I would rather, very much rather, be alone in the town. For the South is home, sweet home to me. Southern days, southern ways, southern cotton and corn. And southern cook, don't eat book, down where I was born. No, no, southern skies, need southern skies, have your brain in a world. Okay. So you get the picture. I mean, this is, you'd rather be alone in the South than anywhere else. I mean, you, it's, it's a great place to be. And of course, then you get to Louis Armstrong and uh, when it's Sleepy Time Down South, recorded in 1931, or at least written then. And it's written by four African Americans. So again, I guess it's okay to be in the South no matter what race you are. I mean, it's, this, is, this is fine. So native Southerners express the same sentiment as Northerners. And they use similar themes, and I've got the lyrics for this, too. Uh, in fact, Louis Armstrong did a video, a music video of this in the 1940s. Anybody ever seen this thing? It's an it's a, it's a early music video, and it, they're, they're sitting around on, like, a dock, uh, and they're all taking a nap, and they're, they're singing this song. Um, and it's been, it's been criticized for being overtly racist now. Louis Armstrong is the one that produced the video. Uh, so it's, uh, it's interesting how things, you know, how, how attitudes change, but... Uh, you know, when you listen to this, and I'm going to play the first part of it because uh, this shows uh, Armstrong has a conversation at the beginning of this recording. He's, he's actually speaking to someone in Chicago, and they're having a conversation about how long he's been there, and they'd rather go back. They'd want to go back home uh, because Chicago's awful. Well, I agree. Uh, so here we go. We'll... we'll uh Coming up the street, look like he's from my hometown. Look like old Charles Alexander, man. Well, 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 what you say, Gabe? Well, what you say, Nipper? Well, what you know, Jim? Oh, nothing much, boy. How long you been up here, boy? Oh, I've been up here about, about a year and a half. Oh, a year and a half? <laughs> well, man, I've been up here a long time myself. I'm going back home. Well, go on, then. Well, oh, I'm going. Get some of them red beans and <laughs> big ears. <laughs> You remember that people did it, Zachary? Get a load you of this. You want, this want some I'm red beans? Back. Who does it? All oh, the fair moon shining, the fields below. Dark is running songs, songs and low. You needn't tell me, boy, because I know. It's sleepy time down south. Soft wind blowing through the pinewood trees. Folk down there live a life of ease. When old mammy falls upon her knees, it's leave it time down south. So again, same themes. Uh, you've got you've got a life of ease. Uh, back, uh, uh, Jeff Rogers is going to give a talk on Thursday. He and I were in a bookstore in, in Columbus, Georgia, two weeks ago, and we were. I was in a used bookstore, and they had these records there. And there was a, he was flipping through these records. There was an album from Seals and Crofts, which 
they had an album entitled Take It Easy. And on the, fr on the album cover, it's a plantation home, <laughs> right? Because this is, these northern, this is what taking it easy was. You had a plantation home, and this was back in the 70s, and you couldn't get away with that now. Then, of course, we get to the 30s, and you got bluegrass, which, of course, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. Alan's going to do a great job, I'm sure, with this. But bluegrass certainly represented a distinctive people, place, and culture, rural Appalachia. That's what it was. And the Monroe brothers, or Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys, you know, from the 30s to 1996 when Bill Monroe died, this was an important part of Southern music and Southern culture. And if you look at uh, these tunes, and my old Southern home, of course, is Bill Monroe. Uh, and then this next one is, uh, I love this song, W. Leo Daniels and uh, Hillbilly Boys, Please Pass the Biscuits, Pappy, right? I mean, it's... You go to a meal and you got to have Pappy pass the biscuits. I mean, this is what's important. You know, you got to you got to eat. So, uh, you know, my old Southern home. So let's let's hear that. In my dear old Southern home, I was happy as I could be. But a morning bird sings that night while they're resting at the low low cabin by the sea. You you lay, you lay. It's my, in my dear old southern home. It's where I'm happiest. I'm not happy anywhere else, but in my home. And again, home means something. People said that. Home. All right. And then please pass the biscuit. Apparently, Lyndon Johnson loved this song, so it makes me not want to like it, but I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll. Have you ever heard this song before? I like bread and biscuits, big white fluffy biscuits. My dear old ma just makes them grand. Ma we makes like them grand. And play and try to make folks happy. We hope you say, please pass the biscuits, Pappy. I like mountain music, good old mountain music, played by the real hillbilly band. In the 1940s, you get to Phil Harris. Now, does anybody know who Phil Harris is? Uh, Phil Harris uh, was born in Indiana, but brought to Nashville as a baby, and so he considered you know, Nashville to be his home. But uh, he was the band director and Southern character in the Jack Benny Show, which, of course, the Jack Benny Show was huge in the United States. And he was later the voice for, uh, for Disney in The Jungle Book. He was uh, Baloo in The Jungle Book, and he was in The Aristocats and Robin Hood. So this guy was a major American actor. And he had a wonderful song that was his signature song, That's What I Like About the South. And I've got this also in your, in your lyrics. It's Phil, Har it's Phil Harris's version. I've got two versions up here. I prefer the second version better uh, by Cliff Bruner um, from Texas. But if you, this is actually written by Andy Razaf, who was a, a Harlem Renaissance writer. So it's written by an African-American. That's what I like about the South. Uh, again, uh, you know, won't you come with me to Alabama? Let's go see my dear old mammy. She's frying eggs and broiling hammy. That's what I like about the South. So uh, now that's not that's the uh, that's the Cliff Bruner version. So I'm going to play both of these because they're fun. This is kind of a swing version. Come with me to Alabama. Let's go see my dear old mammy. She's frying eggs and broiling hammy. That's what I like about the South. Now there you can make no mistakey. Where those nerves are never shaky. Or taste a layer cakey. That's what I like about the South. She's got baked ribs and candy yams. Oh, sugar cured Virginia hams. Basement full of those berry jams. And that's what I like about the South. Hot corn, bread, They wonder why the southern waistline is expanding as you please. over the decades. And it's just... and that's what I like about the South. Ah, don't take one. Have two there, darling. Dark brown and chocolate too Suits me, they must suit you Cause that's what I like about the song Alright, and then the, then the Cliff Bruner version Which I prefer but. This is a nice example of how Southerners can take something 
make it different. It's a little different, but it sounds, in my opinion, better. Let's go down to Alabama and let's go see my dear old mammy. Fried eggs and cooking ham, and that's what I like about the South. She's got big ribs and candy gown, sugar-cured Virginia hound. Sell a full of those berry jams, and that's what I like about the South. Now. By the 1950s, you started to see, uh, late 40s and the 50s, again, this was this idea of getting back to Dixie. This, you got to get home, right? I want to go home. This is the, the diaspora. But Southerners who had ventured out and were, uh, you know, touring in other places of the country, it was always this longing to go back home. And, and then you had television. Perhaps the most famous cowboy in the 1950s, uh, you know, Gene Autry, who was from Texas and Oklahoma, brought the West and the South to every television set in America during the 1950s. And so uh, his Dixie Cannonball in 1946 was a, a very popular song. It was later covered by Hank Williams. And then, and this is interesting, the Vermont group, neo-hippie group, Fish, covered it in 2005. Now, Thomas Naylor would have been proud of that. Right. If anybody knows Thomas Naylor, he was the leader of the Vermont Secession Movement. So here you had uh, uh, Fish. Uh, which is a Vermont group, uh, you know, singing a Dixie Cannonball. And um, the lyrics, I'm heading back to Dixie, that's where I long to be, where the cotton grows and the swanee flows, it's home sweet home to me, where they meet you and they greet you with a great big how you all, we, well, shut my mouth, I'm heading south on the Dixie Cannonball, which is you know, a train going in the south. And then you had um, Red Stewart from uh, Tennessee to Kentucky, he's famous for writing the Tennessee Waltz, which was a very popular song, but got to get back to Dixie here, so same, same type of theme. Well, I just got a feeling about where I long to be. Got Georgia pines running through my mind, and I got to get back to Dixie. Cotton fields as white as snow, call no matter where I go. Dumplings made from sourdough, I've got to get back to Dixie. Ham and grits and turnip greens, old black pot of butter beans. Best darn food I've ever seen, I've got to get back it's to wonderful. Dixie. It's wonderful. I mean, my old mammy. Uh, as I, as I did this presentation, I got very hungry. All right. Now, <clears throat> also in the 50s, you had this view of the South as, again, a component of Southern history. So Johnny Horton's um, The Battle of New Orleans was the number one hit in America at one point, which, of course, tells the story of how Andrew Jackson and his very famous uh, you know, band of, of soldiers beat the British during the, uh, during the War of 1812. And uh, a lot of people, I don't know, lot, some people do know this, but he was actually married to Hank Williams' uh, widow, uh, Billie Jean Jones, uh, you know, uh, Johnny Horton was. And then you have Fess Parker of Texas, uh, one of the most famous American actors of the 50s and 60s, portrayed Southerners David Crockett and Daniel Boone, and of course the Battle of Davy Crockett in 1959, just a, a great... A great tune, and uh, this reminds me of being a kid and watching this uh, show. On a mountaintop in Tennessee, green estate. Remember, don't be a gibber. If you want to free. sing it, sing it. Raised in the woods, so he knew every tree. Killed him a bar when he was only three. Davy, Davy, Davy Crockett, Crockett, king of the wild frontier. Fought single-handed through the engine war. Now, you would not get away with this on modern television. In any way, this would be, you wouldn't even get it out of the draft stage. It's wonderful. All right. <laughs> now, when you get to the centennial, things change. You think about all this stuff from 1900 to 1960 or so. Everything is affirmation. The South is great, Davy Crockett's great, uh, you've got all these songs about how great Dixie is, and everybody thought that. I'm going to go back to Dixie, it's, it's a wonderful place. Then you get to the 60s, and the image of the South begins to change. Now it's the bad other in, in America. It's the bad place. And uh, so Southerners were coping with that. Well, for a long time, y'all loved us, now you hate us. So we're going to be defiant then. 
We're still going to love our people. We're going to still love who we are. And we're going to write songs about how great the South is still, but it's to, it's to tell you to stick it, essentially. Now, uh, Jeff Rogers, I, I've talked to him about his presentation. He's going to do it. He's doing a whole talk about Ronnie Van Zant and Leonard Skinner. That's the whole thing. So I'm not going to. I'll do a little bit. Of, a li I'll mention Skinner, but he's going to do that. Um, and his take on Sweet Home Alabama is really interesting. Um, and so I hope that uh, you know you, you all are sticking around for that for Thursday. Uh, but the centennial, and I'm going to talk about the war tomorrow in a whole presentation. This created an interest in the Confederacy, its music, its soldiers. And so the rebel Johnny Yuma, the Virginian, the uh, Disney movies, the Twilight Zone, all these things were still in popular culture. And there was still this lingering, the South is great, but you started to see a turn. It started to work the other way. Uh, and so the South, again, embraces this rebel image. And outlaw became synonymous with rebel. And Southern music then... Uh, critically challenged both northern conceptions of the South and the Yankee slickers, as Ronnie Van Zant calls them, that uh, created this narrative. It's a great term, Yankee slickers. You know, it's a wonderful term. So by the time you get to the 70s, you see a southern cultural revival. A, 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 on the same line as what you had in the 30s, when you had another southern, it was a literary revival. Here it's in music and, and popular media. Uh, and when we had Cooter at our, uh, at our uh, talk in February, if you haven't gone out to watch that online, it's wonderful. But he talks about how popular Dukes of Hazzard was in, in the early 80s because there was still this defiance. We're going to be unapologetically Southern, and it's going to be great. So brand, bands would proudly way, uh, play in front of Confederate flags or use Confederate symbols. Uh, the Atlanta Rhythm section had a big Confederate flag on their uh, equipment, and, of course, Skinner always played in front of Confederate flags. It was just something you did. It was a symbol of the South. And uh, there's a, a video of one of the last uh, concerts for Skinner that was uh, recorded out in, in Oakland, California. They got a big battle flag behind it. Everybody's out there waving Confederate flags in California. It's like, yeah, this is great. <laughs> uh, you wouldn't see that today. And, and of course, you know, a, a Southern man don't need him around anyhow, right? We don't need you, Neil Young. So you got Merle Haggard. And the Southern Diaspora, this is some of those two pieces I talked about, but Sing Me Back Home. So uh, one of the real, and this guy was a real outlaw. I mean, he, really, he, was, he wasn't a good, good guy. Uh, but uh, from the 60s and 70s, uh, born in Oklahoma, but then moved out to California and helped create that Bakersfield sound. So Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, all these people, uh, Dwight Owens, I'm sorry, Buck Owens, Dwight uh, Yoakum. Amy Lou Harris, Freddie Hart. Freddie Hart from Phoenix City. Uh, That's where I live, Phoenix City, Alabama. There's Freddie Hart Highway. And uh, I always love to play a song in, in my classes. It's, it's entitled Phoenix City, Alabama. But it's the way he says Phoenix City that I say, if you're going to live in Phoenix City, you have to say it this way. It's not Phoenix City. It's Phoenix City, <laughs> Alabama. Uh, you got to say it like that, right? You got to be proud. And, and so... Um, and Freddie Hart's still alive, uh, and he, he lives out in California now, but he's, I don't know, 94 years old, something like that. But you've got uh, Sing Me Back Home, which again, it's... Just before he reached my if, you, if you don't cry at this song, you're not, you're not alive, right? Playing friend to my request Let him sing me back home With a song Take me away and turn back the years and sing me back home before I die. I recall. So that's certainly, I mean, that's why I titled this, you know, because it is, let's sing me back home before I die. And Alan got into that a little bit with the gospel and what that, that, that means in a way, you know, but. Um, certainly, it still means secularly a place. Um, and then you get all the, all the southern hippies, right? The, the Allman Brothers, Skinner, all these bands that uh, they looked a little different, but they were still singing southern music. And the thing I like about this is from their first album. They're standing in front of a plantation home. These are the American ruins. If you think about it, people go over to Europe, they go to Rome, and they, they walk around, wow, look at the ruins, and they walk around Greece, and they go, look at the, they go to Athens, look at the ruins. Nobody goes up north and looks at old homes, but they all come down here, and they want to look at our ruins, right? That's what they want to see. 
There's no, I don't, I don't, you don't have any coffee table books about old northern homes that were torn down, but you got coffee table books that have pictures of southern plantation homes that are gone. There are ruins. And so the All Allman Brothers Band from Florida and then on to Macon, Georgia, often considered to be the, the founders of Southern Rock. They actually had the number one album in 1973, Brothers and Sisters. Think about the title. It's families, brothers and sisters. Right? It's, it's, it's family. It's people. Uh, and they were popular throughout the United States and, and, of course, helped in Jimmy Carter's 1976 campaign. Uh, Carter was that outsider, that peanut farmer. I don't know if you'll ever see that again. A guy that was a farmer running for president, and that was his, that was his appeal. Hey, we got this farmer, and you got this guy, you know, Billy Beer, and his brother, he's funny guys, you know, his, uh, his socks are white, his jeans are blue, and his neck is red. I mean, this is great stuff, right? Um, so they didn't like the term Southern Rock because they thought it was just rock, but um, I included this song Southbound because it's one of their, you know, I, I love this song. Now, I've got the lyrics for it here too. But it's still that same idea. I'm going home. I'm going southbound, just like the Dixie Cannonballs. The same. I'm going southbound. And then you got Charlie Daniels, who I think did the mixture of affirmation and defiance better than any Southern rock band. And Charlie Daniels, the Charlie Daniels band is a Southern rock band. It's often considered to be country. It's Southern rock. Uh, of course, Daniels was born in, in North Carolina, but then, you know, now lives in Tennessee. And when you look at these tunes, and I've included the song Tennessee in here uh, because I love that song. I don't have the, the clip of it. I actually deferred to, to Clyde Wilson and did the Carolina song instead. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, he had two songs. He has Carolina, I Remember You, and then he has Carolina. But he's got a song to Georgia, a song to Tennessee, a song to Texas, a song to Dixie. And then he's got the defiant stuff. The South's going to do it again. Long-haired country boy. Simple man. Uh, so I'm going to play these clips. Uh, I've got the lyrics to Tennessee and, uh, and Simple Man, but we'll play Carolina. It's an interesting song because they start with a chorus and then they go into the song. When I struck out in New Orleans, trying to do or die on my guitar. I always thought someday I'd be returning, but I kept drifting with that same old traveling wind. Can I still call you home? Or have I stayed away too long? Carolina, would you have me back again? chorus again. And then you've got Simple Man, which is written in 1989, so it's, but it's a real song of defiance, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I ain't nothing but a simple man. They call me a redneck, a reckon, and I am, but this thing's going on. You've been mad down to the core. I wonder why Trump didn't like use this as a theme song or something. There's crooked politicians <laughs> and crime in the street, and I'm madder than hell, and I ain't gonna take it no more. 
Tell our kids to just say no And then some panty waist judge lets a drug dealer go He slaps him on the wrist and he turns it back out on the town But if I had my way with people selling dope Take a big tall tree and a short piece of rope I'd hang them up behind them swing till the sun goes down Well, you know what's wrong with the world today People done gone put the Bibles away They're living by the law of the jungle, not the law of the land Well, the good book says it, so I know it's the truth And I'm for an eye and a tooth for a tooth You better watch where you go and remember where you've been That's the way I see it, I'm a simple and again, be proud of your rebel because the South's going to do it again, right? That was, it's, a, it's a Southern anthem. So then you had Southern rock, and I've included a couple of, uh, of songs here, but Leonard Skinner, of course, they're on their farewell tour now, so if you've never seen Leonard Skinner, it's, it's only got one original band member, but uh, it's not really Leonard Skinner anymore. But if you want to see Leonard Skinner, they're on tour, uh, and of course, Jeff Rogers is going to do that. But Sweet Home Alabama, working for MCA, which is such a song of defiance. You know, you got these guys uh, being abused by Yankee slickers, making them sign a contract and paying them nothing so they can play this music. All I can do is write about it, which I included the lyrics to that uh, in this uh, talk. I'm a country boy, and um, and some of their newer stuff, Gods and uh, God and Guns, and uh, some of that stuff is, is pretty good. Uh, the Marshall Tucker Band from South Carolina is still around, still touring. The Carolina Dreams, which is an album you know, entitled that. Hillbilly Band, which is a fun album. In fact, uh, we wrote a piece on the website, or had a piece published on Toy Caldwell, and his daughter contacted us and said, thank you for writing that piece about my dad uh, on your website. So uh, we do, some people do find us, and you, know, you wouldn't even expect it. Uh, Fire on the Mountain, and then Molly Hatchet, <laughs> which is uh, one that, and I, I didn't tell the story about Tom Daniel, but I also knew Tom was all right because he started talking about Molly Hatchet one day when I first, uh, first met him, and he was talking about a Molly Hatchet cover band, and I thought, this guy's all right, he's talking about Molly Hatchet. Uh, nobody, nobody talks about Molly Hatchet. So here we got uh, Gator Country, which is about Florida, so I include something about Florida, he used to live there, so... Uh. <laughs> This is one of these songs about, you know, talking about different states, places. Now, most people have heard of Barefoot Jerry only because Charlie Daniels sang about them. So nobody's ever, it's like, oh yeah, Barefoot Jerry, but they never heard anything they, that the band played. So I'm going to play you a Barefoot Jerry song. It's Smokies. And I love this tune. It's, it's an interesting song. I would, these guys are like the, uh, the Southern Crosby, Stills, and Nash. It was kind of the sound that they had. And they had a song entitled Hospitality Song. Y'all mentioned, and it was about that. Come on down the South, kick your shoes off. It's great down here. Uh, it's wonderful. It doesn't matter what state you're from. We don't care what state your mind is in. You just come on down the South, and, you, and you'll love it down here. Uh, and, uh, of course, that's too open an invitation today. Uh, maybe they should rescind that invitation. But uh, here's the Smokies. Uh, he's only got one channel. You're not going to hear it. To go in the spring, in the fall, and in the snow. There's lots of friendly people there, and you don't have to bother to cut your hair. The Smoky Mountains is the place to put a big smile on your face. The trees are yellow, fit, and green. It's the prettiest place I've ever seen. Ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-ba-
about that? No telephones to blow your high. Nothing but clean air in the sky. I mean, this was a wonderful message. And uh, it's, um, it's, it's and of course, you had other bands, Wet Willie, Elvin Bishop, The Outlaws, all this Southern music in the 70s. It was all over the place. And they all sang of region, people, place, defiance, example, Skinners, but we smiled at the Yankee Slicker with a big old Southern grin, you know, so it's fantastic stuff. And then, of course, you have Hank Williams Jr. from Alabama, uh, famous because of his name, but um, uh, he had several albums uh, dedicated to his uh, father's music, but sought a new, uh, new trajectory and identity in the 1970s. And uh, then, of course, he had his terrible accident where they reconstruct his face, but uh, Williams really was a fusion of uh, country and southern rock, which made him one of the most popular artists in the late 70s and early 80s. And so you have all these songs of defiance and, and also affirmation. Uh, you've got the New South, and I, I included, um, and included any lyrics. Some of them are a little bit indelicate, but uh, Dixie on my mind, the New South, the American Way. American Way is such a, uh, it's a funny tune, and, and um, that's the song of defiance. So we'll start with that one. It's, And the first line is great. If you fly in from Birmingham, you'll get the last gate. If you flew in from Boston, no, you sure won't have to wait. And I'm learning. <laughs> I love that. A little more every day. Oh, about the power of the dollar and the people with white collars and the good old American way. Help when they see my blue jeans. Some slick where the suit walks up. Oh, can I help you, please? Yes, I'm learning. And think about that. This is the plain and folk. This is the idea. Day. You got this. This. Uh, it's not. It's not class consciousness. It's folk consciousness. And uh, he's talking about the dollar, but you know, we, we always have that American southern trend of you know defiance to banks and and uh, things like that. So, all right. Then, of course, the I love this line of New South here. Um, hopefully it'll work. Uh-oh. No New South? Okay. Well, we'll just go on. Now nah, my PowerPoint's not working. Let's try that again. Let's try this again. There it goes. Last fall we elected the man from Plains And there was lots of talk about a great big change But the Atlanta Braves they still lose too many games <laughs> And the New South, thank God, is still the same It's great. It's still longing for the old. Alabama, uh, of course, still around. This is really the zenith of Southern country music uh, influence. Most recently, they have an album entitled Southern Draw. They came out with another album. Uh, and they had over 40 number one hits. And last year, of course, Alan played a little uh, Alabama at our, uh, at our banquet there. So um, Song of the South. And he played High Cotton. That's right, you played High Cotton, which is a great tune. But Song of the South is one of these, you know, you had this in the 80s still, People was okay to sing about the South, but it was becoming much more marginalized. I mean, after Alabama, I think it's become much more marginalized. This was still popular. It really wasn't until the 90s that you started seeing it become a little more marginalized. And it's starting to come back, though. I will say there's, there's an effort to bring back some of this music. Um, and, of course, you know, these songs portrayed a South dominated by resolute families facing poverty and despair with nostalgic respect for the people and the past and the land. That's what it's about. This is why this, this appealed to people so much. Um, and so, because of time, I'm, gonna, I'm sure you all have heard uh, Song of the South. Well, I'm going to skip through it. Um, now, a modern Southern revival. Uh, most modern country music has become, as Shooter Jennings describes it, a dirt road free-for-all. It's, a, it's, it's a packaged for Midwestern housewives, and it must include a dirt road, cowboy boots, a drink, and an allusion to a girl in short shorts. If you got that, you've got the modern country song covered. Now, I can't fix that, but I can fix a drink, right? So in other words, it's lost the soul that made it country. It lost the southern part of it. But there is a reaction to this. So southern simply became country. 
So this is this is how the the North took something that's Southern and oh that's ours. It's like they took George Washington and said that's ours. They take these things and say that's ours. It's been that way. It's just country. No, it's Southern. Uh, so you know uh, Travis Tritt's country and Travis Tritt from Georgia, country ain't country no more. But really what he's saying is the South ain't the South anymore. That's what he's saying. Or Montgomery Gentry's daddy won't sell the farm. You know. Um, he's in the eye of an urban storm, but daddy won't sell the farm. So these are southern themes, agrarianism, family, kith, and kin, but they're marketed to a much broader audience, and that's so it's appealing to Iowa as well as Alabama. Uh, but there has been a consciously southern revival since the early 2000s from both male and female country artists about family, place, and these are all wrapped in a neat southern package. So um, you got Jamie Johnson from Alabama, um, and if you... Uh, Tom and I have a, a friend named Carl Jones, of course, friend with the Institute. Jamie Johnson and Carl Jones could be twins when it comes to their singing voice. They sound exactly the same. So every time I hear Jamie Johnson, is that Carl or Jamie Johnson? Uh, but here you got, I love this line uh, in, in this California riot, 2010. And I've got this uh, included here, I think. Or do I have this in here? Yeah, I've got it. I pulled off the gravel with my California drink. Is that not Carl Jones? <laughs> everything I ever loved behind. Well, I left Alabama, but it never once left me. And it's still the only refuge of my mind. Cause where are you gonna be when half of California riots? Where are you gonna run to when the lights go out? I won't be hanging out in California, I won't try it, buddy, I'll be up and headed south. That's it. Uh, now, Miranda Lambert, major, major country star. This song, Sweet By and By, my, my daughters love it. Uh, it is, it's a beautiful song, and it's about family, and it's all from an album entitled Southern Family. And I've included the lyrics to it because, you know, it's, it's a father talking to his daughter, and then it's a mother talking to her daughter about family and what you should do, and so it's just a beautiful song, and, and um, I wanted to include it for that reason. So uh, now this next song, um, Whiskey Myers from Texas, entitled Mud. Now, I, I love this tune. I've got the lyrics to it. You really have to go through the lyrics to get what they're talking about here. And it's, it is a harder edge song. It's got a real mean guitar to it. Um, but it's about growing up on a farm on the Mississippi River and the bankers coming to take it and what they're going to do. They're going to kill them before they get that farm. It is a great tune, and this, uh, they have a number of other songs, Battle of the Southern Man, but deep down in the South, these guys are consciously Southern, and they love the South, and they sing about home and people and place. And if you read these lyrics, you'll get it. Uh, and so we'll, we'll play this. This one goes on for a little bit of the song, but uh, you, you got to hear it. That mean slide guitar is great.
So you look at the lyrics, and he, he wants to stay in the place where he's born, where granddaddy tilled the, tilled the land and all his seeds are sown. It's, it's a wonderful. And then, of course, the, they owned the, so they were drowning before the flood because they owned the banker man, all that money. And then the flood came in and washed them away, and they're drowning in the mud. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's great. Uh, and then you've got this band, Cadillac 3. Now, I didn't include this, um, this accent, the song here, but I like that song. Uh, but this is a real affirmation of place in this particular part of the song. So I wanted to play it. It's real short. All this is where I was born and this is where I'll die. Yeah, this is where I was Again, born from Tennessee, these guys love the sound. All right, last slide, and you've got uh, you've got these lyrics in here. Um, so I, I want to conclude with this: "You'll never leave Harlan alive." There was a great show for years entitled "Justified," and it was about Kentucky. And I want to start actually down here because when you look at this thing of defiance, and of course what's going on in Kentucky in the song "You'll Never Leave Harlan Alive," I'm going to play it for you. But it's about blood and family and place and Yankees. There's a great line in about how they come and showing hundred dollar bills, and that's how they knew they had to dig coal because the Yankees came in and showed. There's coal in there. Here's a hundred dollars. Go dig it. Right. So these they didn't know it until the Yankees told them about it. But their last scene, if you has anybody watched Justified, the last episode is one of the most beautiful episodes ever made. The last scene, or ne it's the next to last scene. Or is it, is it when Raylan is with uh, Boyd, is that the last scene? The last scene. If you, again, if you don't cry on that, you're not human. Because these two guys, one Raylan Givens, who was a federal marshal, chasing down Boyd Crowder, who's the criminal, the whole show. There are these two arch nemesis. And Boyd Crowder's in jail. And Raylan comes all the way to the jail to tell him that his wife was dead when she really wasn't. But his wife was dead. And, and Boyd says to him, wait a second, Raylan, now you came here. All the, you could have just sent me a... a phone call. You could have sent me a letter, something saying she's dead, but you drove all the way down here to tell me face to face why. That was his line. Because we dug coal together. It's people. It's place. It's wonderful. We dug coal together. That meant, that meant something. They were there together. This, these were two people didn't see eye to eye, but again, individuals could get along, but this is, this, they had a bond that was deeper than anything else because they went out in that coal mine and they dug coal, they dug coal together. So I'm going to play this, this Daryl Scott song, You'll Never Leave Harlan Alive. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to start with the, with the Brent Cobb song. This is a newer song. Brent Cobb's from Georgia. And again, it's about family down in the gully. And it's, it's got that theme of moonshine to it, outlaws. You're, you're making moonshine. People are trying to get you. And uh, this is a wonderful little tune. And I've got the lyrics for it, too. Um, but he's proud of his family. No matter what anybody says, he's proud of them. Well, my granddaddy was a good man, no matter what the papers say. He worked till he bled for everything he had, brought us up to do the same. One afternoon in June, they had us working just like a couple mules. My cousin and me were torn a feet deep and covered in red mud clay. And who hasn't been out in June? <laughs> Covered in play yeah, work. We ran power from the creek bed through the woods to the old gray shack. It was worth the trouble to work them shovels for granddaddy sour mass stand. All the weeds and pecan trees had a secret we all swore to keep. But my granddaddy knew what the law would do if they ever come snooping around back. Lord, I'm down in the gutter where the creek is high. Lord, I'm down in the gully where only the moonshine. And 
And this this next chorus is just true. Without money you can't buy no, next nothing. Verse. And nothing is a damned old shame. <laughs> when you in the hole, you say your soul for running water instead of rain. But where the hills were filled with the smell of cash, cooking in the copper steel. Everybody knew where to get their brew And that made our family name Lord, I'm down in the gutter Where the creek is high Lord All right, I'm going to back up and do the next one. Um, so, again, it's your family name that means something. No matter what it was, no matter what the paper said, no matter what they said when I went to South Carolina about Clyde Wilson, I knew he was great. Right. <laughs> so, and that, of course, Kerry Roberts can attest to that. No matter what they said, what would they say about your people? You know the truth. You know the truth. You know, no matter what they say about us, you know the truth. And then we've got uh, you never leave Harlan alive. And this is, again, that gets into that idea of, uh, you know, where you're from. And we'll, we'll conclude with that. So we'll... this is a haunting song. In the deep. Dark hills of eastern Kentucky That's the place where I trace my bloodline And it's there I read on a hillside gravestone You will never leave the heart Well, my granddad's dad walked down Catarines Mountain And he asked Tilly Hilton to be his bride Said, oh, won't you walk with me Out of the mouth of this a holler Or we'll never leave a heart alive Where the sun comes up about ten in the morning and the sun goes down About three in the day and you fill your cup With whatever bitter brew you're drinking You spend your life just thinking of how to get away No one is So uh, that's it, you know, and you have that idea of, of poverty in that, too, and what, the, you know, punish with poverty the South and what they face and how the North was telling them you had to, here's your hundred dollar bills, go dig that coal. And you were digging it, as the, as the lyrics say, from the bottom of your grave, digging that coal from the bottom of your grave. Thank you for your time today. Hope you enjoyed it.